True Crime South Africa is published in conjunction with Tiso Blackstar Group, publishers of Times Live, Business Live, Sowetan Live, and others. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily represent the views of Tiso Blackstar Group or its affiliates. Welcome to True Crime South Africa. I'm your host, Nicole Engelbrecht. And you're listening to episode 20, The Fenter Family Massacre. Before we get into today's episode, I'd like to give a quick shout out to our new Patreons. Thank you to Jaden Haramsa, Deirdre Trevor, and Amy March for your support. Patreon support goes towards helping to increase our research capacity and to buy new equipment. True Crime South Africa is a one woman operation. So, trust me, every bit of support helps. If you'd like to contribute towards the show's running costs, you can go to patreon.com and search for True Crime South Africa. Or if you prefer a once-off donation, we also have a paypal.me link. I'll put both links in the show notes. I hadn't heard about today's case until I saw a recent article on News24, which I posted to our Facebook group. You all reacted with as much horror as I did, and asked for an episode on the case. The case is topical again at the moment, because the offender in question has been granted parole. While parole is a necessary part of our justice system, and I understand that the whole point of incarceration is rehabilitation and possible release back into society, when I started researching this man's crimes, and looked at how he served his sentences, it just felt wrong. Another reason that I wanted to cover this case is there's a victim involved who never really had a voice, in life or in death, and although she got what some might call justice, I felt she deserved for her story to be told. Let's get into episode 20, The Fenter Family Massacre. The following episode may contain sensitive material including descriptions of violence, sexual assault or graphic descriptions of injuries to victims. If you feel you may be triggered by such material, please consider this before accessing our content. To access trauma counselling or services, please see the helpline information on our show notes. Flippy Fenter was born Philippus Jacobus Fenter in 1972. Flippy would later claim that he had a very difficult childhood due to both of his parents being alcoholics. He and his sister Rika were taken out of their parents' care on several occasions and lived in a children's home for two years. When Flippy and his sister were in their parents' care, they moved regularly due to his father's job as a driller for the Department of Water Affairs. Rika would later say that their father had abused their mother and her and her brother, throughout their childhood. She went for counselling to deal with her childhood trauma, but she felt that many of her brother's emotional issues stemmed from their difficult childhood. After matriculating, Flippy served his period of conscription in the army, and then held down several odd jobs before eventually deciding to sign up to the Air Force. Flippy would go on to marry his wife Millie, and in 2001, they were living on Hoodsprate Air Force Base when they welcomed their first child into the world. Flippy's sister would say that her brother doted on his daughter Millie's, and whenever she would phone, he would be interacting with the child. Millie also became employed by the Air Force at this time as a secretary to a colonel. In 2002, the young couple received the news that Flippy was being deployed on a peacekeeping mission to Burundi. With such a young child, this must have been an extremely stressful situation for the couple. But I think that if you're in the military, there's always the understanding that you'll have to go where you're sent. Just before Flippy was sent to Burundi, Millie fell pregnant again and gave birth to their son, Yanku. Cool. 
Burundi is a central African country that is landlocked between Tanzania and the Democratic Republic of Congo. The country has an extremely unstable history, and in the 1960s and 1990s, civil wars and ethnic cleansing turned Burundi into a war zone. The periods of genocide and civil wars in Burundi were between the Hutu people and the Tutsi people, both Burundian ethnic groups. Between 1962 and 1993, an estimated 250,000 people were killed in clashes and ethnic cleansing exercises in Burundi. The genocidal actions were first perpetrated against the Hutus by a Tutsi-led army in the 70s, and then in 1993, the tables turned with mass killings of Tutsi people by the Hutu majority. South Africa had been involved for many years, along with the UN, in trying to broker peace between the two warring factions. In 2000, an agreement called the Arusha Peace and Reconciliation Agreement was reached in which a transitional government would take control of Burundi and ease it into democracy. Several ceasefires failed, but by 2001, there was a tentative balance forming in the country, and several countries, including South Africa, agreed to send in peacekeeping missions to ensure that agreements were adhered to. The years of instability and war broke Burundi, economically and socially. The children of Burundi perhaps suffered the most. Children as young as 10 were given guns and enlisted as members of the militia on both sides of the fight. There are reports of children who were born into mixed Hutu and Tutsi families being forced to kill their own parents. Female children were sold into sex slavery and even today it's not uncommon to see girls as young as 11 years old working as prostitutes in order to survive. When Flippy Fenso was sent to Burundi in 2002, there was a lull in violence. The atmosphere was still highly charged, and no one doubted that the ticking bomb that was genocide could explode again at any time. But he wasn't entering an active war zone. In fact, rather than actually protecting any people of Burundi, Flippy was assigned a security detail to a government official. He was, for all intents and purposes, a glorified bodyguard. At this time, 14-year-old Teresa Nkeshimana, a Burundi citizen, had been orphaned by the violence in her country. With very little family left, the child was left to fend for herself, and sadly the only option open to her was prostitution. The ways in which girls end up as prostitutes in Burundi are innumerable. Sometimes it's a much maligned choice. As much as a child of that age is equipped to make such a choice, in a world where the other option is starving. Very often, though, family members sell or con young girls into becoming involved with prostitution. Girls from rural areas are promised jobs in the city, and when they get there, the job is not what they were told, and alone and without resources, they're trapped. It's a classic human trafficking situation. Girls like Teresa are sitting ducks for violence and disease, with the rates of HIV infection among child prostitutes in Burundi being astronomical. It is unknown as to whether the 19th of September 2004 was the first time that Flippy Fenta had met Teresa Nkishimana. By that time, Flippy had been in Burundi for two years. He had been sent home for a brief stint, but he'd been seconded again very shortly afterwards. I highly doubt that his meeting with Teresa was the first time he had frequented sex workers, though. A taxi driver, Claude Demasini, fetched Flippy and then Teresa 
on the evening of the 19th of September 2004. He would later testify that Flippy had told him that he wanted to have sex that night. Claude last saw the pair when he dropped them off at a local hotel. The next time he would see Flippy would be in court. On the morning of the 20th of September 2004, passers-by discovered the body of 14-year-old Teresa Ngshamana in a ditch. Teresa's body was taken to a mortuary, where it is claimed that video footage was taken of her body and an autopsy was performed. Teresa's body, though, was buried within 24 hours of her being found. The first time I read about this strange development was in a News 24 article, and the article stated that it's law in Burundi that prostitutes must be buried within 24 hours of their death. When I read that, my mind boggled a bit. My first thought was maybe it's for religious purposes, as I know Muslims specifically have a time span in which they're required to bury the dead. But looking at Burundi's religious makeup, less than 1% of their people are Muslim, so I knew it wasn't that. I couldn't find any proof on any other forum that such a law exists in Burundi. It could be true, but I couldn't find anything to back it up. Then I found another resource that said that it's actually the families of prostitutes that insist on the practice. So in Teresa's case, allegedly one or two remaining members of her family were found, and they apparently insisted that she be buried without any funeral as soon as possible in order to, quote, minimize their shame, end quote. Now, I don't want to be disrespectful of other people's cultures, but a 14-year-old girl who had no other choice but to work as a sex worker Hell, maybe she was even forced into the work by those very same family members, is viciously murdered and dumped in a ditch like a piece of garbage. And her so-called loved ones' greatest concern is not collecting evidence or finding her killer, but hiding the fact that she was a sex worker? Really? Anyway, I could talk for hours just on the topic of how completely unfair that is. The police, thankfully, did recognise that Teresa deserved justice, and they started talking to some of the other girls to find out who Teresa had last been seen with. Many of the girls clearly remembered her getting into a taxi that night, and she was with a man they referred to as one of the rich military men. Having a military presence of foreigners in their country has become a way of life for Burundians, and the young prostitutes soon figured out that these men, compared to their poverty-stricken lives, had a decent amount of money. It is known among the child prostitutes of Burundi that a military man is a prize catch, and they vie for the attentions of such men. That statement is so sick that I struggle to say it, but such is life for these children. The Burundian police were able to get a description of the taxi that had transported Teresa to her death that night, and they soon tracked down Claude Demasini, who identified his male passenger as South African, Flippy Fenter. Once they figured out where Flippy was living, the police realised that it was very close to where Teresa's body had been found. Flippy would eventually be charged with going AWOL as well, and the circumstances around that charge are a bit muddied. It appears that Flippy returned to his post after curfew on the night of the 19th of September. When exactly he was arrested for Teresa's murder is also not certain, but within 10 days he was taken into custody. At some stage, Flippy also got into an altercation with a Burundian security guard, and he was charged with assault against this man as well. 
A charge of rape was also added to the case, as police believed that Teresa had been forcibly penetrated. While in custody, Flippy Fenter admitted to having murdered Teresa Nkishimana. He told the police that he'd taken Teresa to a hotel to have sex with her. They had consensual sex once, according to him, and when he wanted to have sex again, Teresa had declined. He said that he'd become enraged and strangled her to death. It is unknown whether he admitted to raping her after he'd killed her. Flippy pointed out both the hotel room in which he'd killed Teresa, as well as the ditch in which he dumped her. His face and chest were covered in scratches, presumably from Teresa fighting for her life. Flippy Fenta was held in a military jail in Burundi for six months. He would later lament the fact that his cell was in fact a shipping container and it was very hot. Very soon after he was arrested, Flippy changed his mind about his confession and attempted to retract it. He claimed to have been the victim of a setup, implying that some of the government officials he'd been protecting had been involved in the murder and he was being used as a scapegoat because he was a foreigner. Seven weeks after her death, Teresa's body was exhumed, and a South African forensic pathologist was asked to perform a post-mortem. Now, you'll recall that I said that Burundian authorities had claimed to have done an autopsy after recovering Teresa's body initially. I don't know where the information from that autopsy went, or even how detailed an autopsy was done. Because when South African pathologist, because when the South African pat- because when the South African pathologist received the already severely decomposed remains, he was unable to even identify what the manner of death had been. Throughout the investigation, in fact, it seems as though Teresa's manner of death has always been based solely on Flippy's admission that he strangled her. I completely understand that the South African pathologist would have wanted to have made an unbiased report. So he would likely not have looked at any other evidence prior to his viewing of Teresa's body. What is odd though, is that there was allegedly video footage of Teresa's body. Could that not have been viewed by an independent person, in conjunction with the two autopsy reports, and some determination made from there? There is only one mention ever made of the first autopsy. I tend to think that, under pressure from the family to bury Teresa, the initial autopsy was either botched or done very superficially. Flippy's lawyers attempted to cast doubt on the entire investigation, most likely due to Burundi's lack of a proper burial system. When the body was exhumed, they insisted on having teeth tested by forensic odontologists to determine the age of the person that had been exhumed. Possibly because Burundi is famous for mass burials and unmarked graves. They were trying to imply that there was no way of knowing where Teresa's body even was. So, if they couldn't do their own autopsy, that would be unfair to Flippy's case. Strangely, they almost got that right, because the first forensic odontologist to look at the teeth said they belonged to a 32-year-old person. A second odontologist put that age at around 16. I looked into the science of forensic odontology a bit, and found that it's most useful and accurate in the identification of remains when compared to dental records of a known subject. Where it becomes a little bit more iffy is when they try and use a single extracted tooth to determine age, which is exactly what happened here. In small children, it's easier, because the presence of milk teeth can point towards a specific age group. In adolescents and adults, though, the margin for error becomes a lot wider, and this is compounded by the fact that 
not all forensic odontologists use the same methods. The margin for error in adolescents and adult tooth aging, according to an article in the Forensic Odontology Review, is as large as 10 years. With that in mind, and also the fact that nutrition can play a role in the aging of teeth, and we know that Teresa was living a life of poverty and probably eating very poorly, the huge gap in age estimation between the two forensic odontologists seems a little less worrying. The trial for Teresa's murder was originally going to be held in Burundi, and we know that some of the process was conducted there because Flippy's wife and his sister travelled to Burundi to support him. Six months after his arrest, though, Flippy was released on bail and allowed to return to South Africa. It was decided that the rest of the trial would take place in South Africa. Let's talk for a minute about Millie Fenta. She was 33 at the time of her husband's arrest. She'd spent two years on her own while he was in Burundi and was raising two small children. I would assume that people living on the Air Force base would become like family, so I'm sure that she had a good amount of support. But it still must have been difficult. Now picture her being called into the colonel's office one day to be told that her husband had been arrested in Burundi for the rape and murder of a 14-year-old child. That moment must have been completely terrifying for her. Millie was in the dark about a lot of what happened in Burundi. We don't know what Air Force officials told her, but I'm sure it would have been in their best interest to downplay the incident at first. When she was able to speak to her husband, he claimed innocence. He told her that it was all a setup, and that he was being used as a scapegoat. With only that information, it's completely understandable that Millie made the decision to stand by and support her husband. Flippy returned to South Africa and moved back into his home on the Air Force base with his family. For 18 months, the trial continued in fits and spurts at the Taba Chwane military court. The trial was overseen by three judges who also held rank in the military. The reason that this case was tried in military court is, of course, because Flippy Fenter was on duty in Burundi, and enlisted at the time of the offence. The reason that a military court exists at all is because the military is supposed to hold itself to a higher state of discipline than civilian society. Essentially, the military sees an offence by one of its own members as more serious than a civilian having committed the same crime, because members of the military have enlisted to protect their country and through that commitment, uphold its laws. Military courts are generally less lenient than civilian courts, and less likely to consider mitigating factors in sentencing. The trial was the first of its kind, as Flippy was the first South African to be accused of the murder of a citizen of a host country while on a peacekeeping mission. And this likely added to the delays as the court moved carefully to avoid contravening any required procedures in South Africa or Burundi. The Fenter family was reportedly struggling at this time, and understandably so. Millie started to have panic attacks, and she started going for counselling sessions. She asked Flippy to attend counselling sessions as well, and he agreed. He would later allege that his psychologist had instructed him to only have six sessions and come back after the trial was finished to do the rest. As the trial started to reach a crescendo, the media picked up on the story 
and Millie, who up until that point had relied on her husband for information about the case and believed him to be innocent, came across an article that made her wonder. A journalist had published some of the evidence that was being presented against Flippy, and Millie found out for the first time that there were eyewitnesses, including two of Flippy's co-workers, who had seen him with Teresa that night. She also read about the taxi driver's evidence and the very detailed confession that her husband had originally given. Flippy continued to deny his guilt and claimed that everything had been fabricated. On the 26th of April 2006, Flippy attended a function with members of his unit at O'Hagan's pub in Hootsbreit. He had three beers at this function and returned home. His wife's co-workers had another function planned for that afternoon, which Flippy and Millie attended together, and Flippy said that he had another three beers at that function. I know it might sound a bit strange that I'm pointing out what he drank, but it'll all make sense a bit later. At the second function, Millie danced with her boss, the colonel. Millie would later say that it was almost a tradition that when the specific song came on, she would dance with her boss, as they both enjoyed a traditional Afrikaans lung aram dance to that specific song. Flippy had never indicated that he had a problem with his wife dancing with her boss to this song, but on that day, a dark cloud gathered over him, and he described feeling intensely jealous as he watched them dance. He later claimed that the colonel was known to cheat on his own wife and have affairs with women on the base, and although he trusted Millie, he was worried that the man was trying something with his wife. When the fences left the function in the late afternoon, Flippy's co-workers said that he appeared sober to them. When they arrived home, Flippy started an argument with Millie about her dancing with her boss. He claimed that during this argument, Millie brought up the trial and said that if he was convicted, she was going to divorce him and that he would never see his children again. Millie's version of events was that Flippy had brought up the trial and said that he was afraid that she was going to leave him because of it, to which Millie says she replied that she had to admit that the evidence she was hearing about it was frightening and if the court found him guilty, she would have to consider whether she could remain married to him. She denies that she ever threatened to keep his children away from him. The argument became loud and heated, and Millie said that she was going to take the children elsewhere so that everyone could calm down, and she would be back later. Flippy refused to allow her to leave, and took the car keys away from her. Millie went to the telephone to call her cousin to ask her to come and fetch her. Flippy ripped the telephone line out of the wall. He then proceeded to lock the front door. While he was doing so, Millie grabbed her children, Millie's five, and Yanku, four, and ran out the back door. Flippy followed her into the street, demanding that she come back inside the house. Likely terrified, Millie refused, saying that if he carried on with his aggressive behaviour, she was going to go to the police. On hearing this, Flippy grabbed his son and ran inside the house with him. Little Millie started crying and begging her mother not to leave her brother behind, so Millie had no choice but to go back inside the house. Inside, Flippy had phoned Millie's mother and with Yanku crying at his feet, he demanded that Millie speak to her mother. He claims that Millie had told her mother that she was finished with him and wanted to leave. Millie ended the call, and then typed the word HELP into her message app, sending it to three people, a friend of Flippy's, her cousin, and a female friend. Flippy walked into the house and lit a cigarette, which he smoked in the garden. After having finished his cigarette, 
Millie said that he walked up to her and calmly thanked her for everything that she and the children had meant to him. He walked into the house, and four-year-old Yanku followed him. Within seconds, Millie said that she heard a blood-curdling scream from her little boy, and then a gunshot. She and Millie's ran into the kitchen, and Flippy emerged from the corridor carrying his R4 rifle. He pointed the rifle at his wife and pulled the trigger, shooting her in the stomach. On seeing her mother get shot, five-year-old Melise screamed and ran out the back door and through the garden towards the neighbor's house. Her father took calculated aim through the wire mesh on the door and shot his daughter in her back. Millie, although severely wounded and losing blood, ran toward the bedroom to find Yanku. She found the child curled up on the bedroom floor in a pool of blood. Millie knelt down next to him, gently trying to see the extent of his wounds. Flippy entered the room and, using the rifle, pushed Millie up against the wall. Hysterical, Millie screamed at Flippy that he had shot their children. He cast a look over his shoulder at his son's lifeless body and looked back at Millie. He told her that he was going to kill her and then himself. Millie realized that she still had her cell phone in her hand from the conversation with her mother. She started dialing numbers and managed to push Flippy away. She fell forward onto the ground and he demanded that she hand over the cell phone. When Millie refused, he stomped on her hand with his boot, ripped the phone away, and smashed it against the wall. He pulled Millie up again, and she bit him in the neck, and used the opportunity to escape from his hold. She ran into the garden, and found her daughter, bleeding on the grass, mumbling faintly. Millie ran screaming up the road, and one of the neighbours came to her aid. The children were rushed to the hospital, but both were pronounced dead on arrival. Millie required life-saving surgery to repair the damage the rifle shot had done to her stomach. Flippy Fenter was arrested by police and found to have slit his wrists. He was taken to hospital for treatment for those wounds, as well as the bite wound on his neck. Millie was able to attend the funeral of her children a week after their death. Millie's and Yanku were buried side by side. At the time that Flippy murdered his children, he had yet to be convicted of the murder of Teresa and Kishamana. Evidence of that crime could therefore not be used in the new trial. Flippy was charged with two counts of murder and one count of attempted murder. Although the crime took place on military property, the decision was taken to hold the trial in a civilian court, because Flippy had not been carrying out military duties at the time of his offence. Flippy pleaded guilty to the charges against him, but claimed that he had no memory of that day, from the point that he had started arguing with his wife. When he presented this evidence, the state challenged his guilty plea, as they believed he was going to attempt a reduced sentence by claiming diminished responsibility. The state briefly requested that the judge reject the guilty plea so that they could proceed with the trial and prove that Flippy was entirely responsible for his actions. The judge listened to the state's case as to the diminished responsibility claim and decided that such a defense would never result in a not guilty finding and, as such, decided to accept the guilty plea and instead hear Flippy's evidence as possible mitigating circumstances in a pre-sentencing hearing. Flippy testified about his poor childhood conditions and then introduced the investigation and trial regarding the murder of Teresa and Kishamana, saying that he had suffered in terrible circumstances while awaiting trial in Burundi, 
and that he'd been under immense psychological pressure at the time that he killed his children. He claimed to have been depressed and suicidal for the 18 months since his return from Burundi. He said that he'd lost 16 kilograms and was convinced that his wife was ashamed of being seen with him because she took a different bus to work. He felt that his marriage had not been the same since his return. He also felt ostracized by his friends and found that people stared at him. Well, Flippy, you had been accused of the rape and murder of a 14-year-old girl. So I'm not sure if you expected for people to fall at your feet and welcome you back and your wife to have absolutely no emotional problem with the fact that you were not only unfaithful to her with a child prostitute, but also that it was seeming more and more likely that she was married to a murderer and rapist. Really, I have no idea why people would treat you differently. Flippy testified that on the day of the murders, he had been unusually emotional and had cried on several occasions. He confirmed that the last thing he remembered was arguing with his wife and then sitting down on a sofa because he felt tired. The next thing he knew, he was waking up in a hospital with a bite wound and his wrists bandaged. He was told that his children were dead. He claimed that he was very drunk when he got home, and he believed that this contributed to his behaviour. So this is why I told you how much he had to drink that day. He had three beers at a function that started at 11 o'clock. His wife fetched him at about two, and said that he was a little bit drunk. That's three beers in three hours. It's a fair amount, but he's not a first-time drinker. He's a 33-year-old man who at the time was well-built and probably weighed between 100 and 120 kilograms. He then went to the second party a few hours later, allegedly having had no alcohol in between, and had another three beers. And yet he claims that he was so intoxicated that the court should consider his intoxication as mitigating circumstances. He was sober enough to aim a rifle at a tiny moving target and hit his mark the first time. Sorry, but I don't buy it. A psychiatric report was presented to the court that stated that Flippy had been under abnormal pressure due to his ongoing first murder trial and that he'd experienced suicidal tendencies before that day. The report also stated that alcohol had become a coping mechanism for him, and that it contributed to exasperating his feelings of jealousy towards his wife's interaction with her boss on that day. The report went on to class his attempted suicide as a clear sign of emotional distress. The state challenged much of this evidence by stating that his wife had shown nothing but compassion and care for him while he'd been imprisoned in Burundi, and when he was on trial. It emerged that Millie had actually taken out a loan and negotiated bail terms through the Air Force herself to get her husband out of Burundi. She'd taken psychological counselling and encouraged him to do the same. These were all signs that she was intent on working on their relationship and supporting her husband. They challenged Flippy's claim that he had no memory of the incident by producing evidence that he had phoned his sister straight after the incident occurred and before he was taken into custody and told her exactly what he had done. Despite all of the challenging evidence in aggravation of sentence, Flippy Fenter received a sentence lower than the minimum for murder. He was sentenced to 15 years for the murder of Malise, with 5 years suspended, 10 years for the murder of Yanku, and 8 years for the attempted murder of Millie. The kicker was that he'd be allowed to serve these sentences concurrently, so in essence, he would only serve 10 years. <laughs> 
the state, on hearing the sentence, immediately lodged an appeal. It is rather unfortunate that the judgment and sentence for Teresa's murder was only given after this judgment, as I think it may have cast a very different light on Flippy Fenter's so-called emotional turmoil. In 2008, he was found guilty and sentenced to 24 years in jail for the murder of Teresa and Kishimana. Unfortunately, there was insufficient evidence to find him guilty of her rape. This is when probably the biggest injustice comes into play, in my opinion. A court decided that he could serve both murder sentences concurrently. So instead of serving 10 years for his children, and then 24 for Teresa, he would only serve a maximum of 24. Well, actually, he only had to serve 12 years, because he could apply for parole halfway. The state's appeal of his sentence for the murder of his family was successful, though, and his sentence for their murders was increased to 18 years, but still concurrent with his other sentence. The appeal court seems to have had a far clearer picture of who Flippy Fenter was, and said that it felt that any alcohol intake on the day of the murders played a very minimal role. They also disregarded his claim of being unable to remember. The judge stated that Flippy had shown a very calm demeanour in all of his actions that day, and that there was no evidence that he had acted under diminished responsibility. In fact, the appeal judge said that he found Flippy to be quite self-absorbed and only seemed concerned about losing his family because he classed them as possessions. I have no doubt that Flippy Fenter was experiencing extreme emotional turmoil on the day he killed his children. It was clearly not a premeditated act. But with the knowledge that we now have of his guilt in the murder of Teresa and Gishamana, we have no choice but to view that emotional turmoil differently. If he was an innocent man accused, and his entire life had been ripped apart, I could see that being a mitigation in sentence. It certainly would have never excused what he did, but being innocent and fighting for your entire life would certainly be stressful. He wasn't innocent though. The pressure he was feeling during the course of his first murder trial was because he knew he was guilty, and he knew he was going to be found guilty. That was the source of his stress. So, Flippy Fenter, in full knowledge that he had put his hands around the neck of an impoverished, desperate child and throttled her to death, used that as mitigating evidence in his trial for murdering his own children. In essence, his excuse was, well, I killed these two children and I tried to kill my wife, but I was really stressed out because I'd killed another child and I knew I was going to have to pay for it. It blows my mind. Sentencing doesn't always go the way we want it to go. I understand that. To be honest, with the increased sentence to 18 years, if he had not been given them concurrently, the sentences may have been fair. I mentioned at the beginning of this episode that I came across this case because there was an article talking about Flippy Fenter's release on parole. Millie Fenter was given the opportunity to argue against his release. Completely understandably, she chose not to appear in person, but wrote a letter saying that she felt he should serve his full sentence. No one could be located to stand at the parole hearing for Teresa and Kishimana, and I think that that mere fact speaks volumes. Flippy Fenter will soon be released back into society after serving 12 years of his sentence. While I am all for rehabilitation, 
I don't really know how you rehabilitate someone who strangled a child who was already in the most desperate of situations. Then less than two years later, looked his four-year-old son in the eye and shot him, and then lined up his rifle like he was hunting an animal and gunned down his fleeing daughter. Millie Fenter doesn't believe he's been rehabilitated either. On hearing that her now ex-husband would be released, she stated that she would immediately be taking out a protection order against him, as she fears for her life. I have no doubt that Flippy Fenter was not in his right mind when he did what he did to his children. But the reason he wasn't in his right mind was because he lost his mind two years prior and killed someone else, except he wasn't under any pressure when he killed Teresa. He just wanted sex, and she didn't want to give it to him. The spokesperson for Correctional Services said that in making their decision to release Flippy, they had considered over 20 different factors, including whether he had participated in prison programs, whether he had changed, and if he followed his correctional services plan. The correctional services considered Fenter fit for parole. Teresa Ngishamana, Melise Fenter, and Yanku Fenter don't get a second chance. Teresa doesn't get the opportunity to pull herself out of her circumstances and rise above them. She doesn't get the opportunity to build a family that won't throw her in the ground to hide their alleged shame. Young Ku doesn't get the chance to grow up and become the man he could have been. Melise doesn't get to own her future either. Their father decided that what he wanted was more important. Millie Fenter was robbed of the opportunity to be a mother to her children. She gave her husband more support than he ever deserved, and in return, he gave her back a lifetime of pain. They say that forgiveness is a gift you give yourself, and not the person you're forgiving. I sincerely doubt that Millie will ever be able to forgive, but even if she could, none of us will ever forget. So Flippy gets to come back out, into our society because the Department of Correction says he's all better now. I really hope they're right. Thank you for listening to episode 20, The Fenter Family Massacre. If you enjoyed this episode, Please remember to subscribe on the app that you're using to listen right now. You can also follow us on social media. We're on Instagram, Twitter and Facebook. I'll be back next Friday with a mini-sode. Until then, thank you for your support and I'll chat to you soon.